Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, and welcome back to the Nano Hub U course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher, a professor of mechanical engineering at Purdue, and we are in the middle of week two, um, and the, this week is about statistics, and today we're going, going to talk about phonon density of states. We'll start with asking and partially answering the question, what is temperature? Temperature, of course, is central to the studies that we're doing of thermal energy. And in, in classical systems, I think we tend to have a fairly uh, intuitive idea about what temperature is. So with the classical harmonic oscillator, we showed in the last lecture that the average energy uh, within the ensemble is just Kb times T, where T is temperature. And so if temperature increases, the average energy increases in proportion. Once we get into quantum systems and different types of statistics, then we're, we're left with uh, looking at a little bit deeper and we have to go inside of this uh, of the distribution function or the average occupation number we called it last time in which case temperature is buried inside of a of a function uh, and so you'll see in in much of the notes and in the accompanying text uh, that we have that we'll we'll use these distribution functions quite a bit um, but later on what we're going to do is we will uh, take temperature derivatives of them for example quite frequently and so really what we're trying to do in those cases is is to extract the temperature dependence of something of some quantity such as energy um, and so that's uh, a little bit different than uh, i think what most people think of when they when they think of energy and temperature they always go hand in hand together uh, but for the most part and for many cases as we showed last time the quantum statistics tend toward the classical statistics at least for higher energy states so uh, we have to we have to kind of handle all of these things and today what we're going to do is talk specifically about phonons and how the energy states are distributed within the possible wave vectors and wavelengths of of the carrier. So I'm going to start with a two-dimensional representation and we've seen this before a little bit. Uh, we had shown earlier that that uh, we could create a, a particle in a box type of formulation um, for phonons for any waves really and that the allowable states were in one dimension we're separated by a distance of 2 pi over L. So now if I have a two-dimensional material, and again, this is on a square lattice, it's not a, any specific material, then I will have a distribution in K space that looks like what's shown on the right, where each allowable K state is separated by uh, a distance 2 pi over L. What I'd like to do is to find out within a certain volume, and I'm going to use quotes around that because in two dimensions volume, when I say volume I mean area, I want to understand how within a certain volume of k-space how many allowable states exist. Once I have that relationship I can calculate this thing called the density of states and this this is a very useful concept because it essentially allows us to uh, more easily generate integ integral definitions of transport um, and heat storage or thermal energy storage. So if we do this, we say that we'd like to count the number of states. So for that we're going to use our old reliable symbol capital N. Again, this is a slightly different one from before, but it's, it's a number. Um, and the number of allowable states or modes, uh, you'll see that terminology used also, will be the area inside of k space, so that's pi times k squared, where k is the magnitude of some wave vector, that's the, the radius of the circle shown in the figure on the right, and then to, to normalize by the, uh, the size of k space that each mode takes, that's going to be 2 pi divided by L all squared, and so now I have a relationship that tells me I can fit so many states inside of a region of k space that's a circle with radius k, and that's the last uh, the last definition here. Now that itself is not the density of states, that's the number of states. The density of states, most often we are going to represent that for phonons with a frequency basis, omega. So I want to find the derivative of capital N with respect to omega, 
And to do so, I'm going to use the chain rule. And so we start out with a, a derivative of n with respect to k, and then multiply by the derivative of k with respect to omega. That should start to look a little bit familiar because if I just invert that, that's actually one divided by d omega dk. That's the term over here. And d omega dk itself is our group velocity. So now we're back to this, at least putting uh, some of the concepts together that we've done before. And then the rest of this is, is fairly standard. The other thing that we'll do um, eventually is we will normalize the density of states by this factor L. Um, so we'll make it a density of states per unit volume quote, with in quotes. Um, and so volume again in, in a two dimensional space uh, is area. So in three dimensions, we follow generally the same procedure. Um, I won't belabor the point here, but now each allowable mode in K space occupies two pi over L all cubed uh, region or volume in K space. And so if we calculate again, the number of allowable modes in K space, in this case, in, in a region with radius K, so that region of radius K in k space will have a k space volume of 4 thirds pi k cubed. We do the same thing, again apply the chain rule, and once again we find that we have a an inverse relationship with this d omega dk which is going to turn into our group velocity. It's also noteworthy that the density of states increases as k increases because as k increases uh, I am adding more and more states, uh, there's more and more volume for a increment of k, k space of k radius that grows. And that's why in three dimensions, the density of states increases with the magnitude of k, uh, and in two dimensions, squared, and in two dimensions, it's a linear relationship. So we, we want to generalize this a little bit I didn't talk about one-dimensional problems, but we can do the same thing for 1D problems. There's only one slight caveat here, and you'll see that if I have a one-dimensional space, so that would mean that I have atoms or allowable modes in k-space that are separated on some regular grid, and let's say that this were k equals zero, I actually can have k going, uh, being positive or negative. This, this uh, italicized k that I show here is actually the magnitude of k, and that's why I have the factor 2 in front. But once again, the allow, each allowable mode in k space occupies a region of 2 pi over L. So that's, what, that's the separation, separation between these points. For these other two, we've already gone through them. And we can um, and we can establish now uh, sort of a general uh, a general uh, representation for the different dimensionalities. So these are the the different dimensionalities, and we'll kind of keep these in our pocket as we go through and talk about density of states for different types of materials: one-dimensional materials, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional. The density of states. Uh, now I'm going to to take a, a little bit of a I, I, we're going to add one thing to this. We're going to normalize by volume. We're going to normalize the density of states when, it, when we actually make it specific to a dimensionality. We'll just divide by 1 over L raised to the power lowercase d, so that's the dimensionality. So in two dimensions, d is 2, so it's 1 over L to the power 2, and so on. And what we find is that for a one-dimensional problem, the density of states is a constant. And so that makes for actually a pretty simple, uh, a simple setup. Uh, these problems, one-dimensional problems, are, are easier in general to solve um, because, of, because of this constancy of the density of states, among other factors. Of course, uh, we, we also uh, tend to prefer one-dimensional integrals, for example. Um, and I'll also notice one other point here. This is the density of states uh, as a function of k. So if we put density of states 
as a function of k, that means that we're calculating it, normalizing it by in wave vector space. If we wanted to put it into frequency space, then we would use the chain rule as we did a couple of slides ago. And this is what we've done here in frequency space. Again, we're just calculating this out now. In one dimension, again, we have this, um, we have a group velocity. So this group velocity term, you can kind of think of it as when I see the group velocity and the density of states, I kind of know that what I've done is I put it into frequency space, right? So all of these ter terms, all these factors just have a one over group velocity in the density of states. And that's why it's important to know uh, what your dispersion curve is, because that's going to tell you um, what the group velocity is as a function of frequency. And in a lot of cases, what we'll do is we'll make some approximations for this group velocity. Uh, that's a fairly routine thing that, that you'll see happen um, in, in later theory when we talk about the heat capacity of a material or its thermal conductivity or its thermal conductance. Uh, but whenever you see the group velocity in the denominator, that means the density of states is, um, is in frequency space now. Uh, and I'll also be ho hopefully very diligent about making sure that I keep the dependency shown um, in, the, in the bracketed term uh, when I talk about density of states. So that if I'm talking about density of states in k-space, then we will um, then we'll have k, a k dependency in, in frequency space, it'll be omega. Now there's one uh, approximation that is very common for phonons, and I want to bring it up now and we're going to revisit it later. I will, um, we'll talk about this uh, in, in much greater detail later, but there's the, something called the Debye approximation. The Debye approximation essentially makes a, an averaging assumption about the group velocity. So you'll notice that we have uh, the, the additional subscript average. And there's a special way that we, can, that we average that, um, or there, there are a lot of different ways to average it actually. And what we find is that uh, we, we can't just choose an average velocity and put it into the relationship. We actually have to, um, we have to do some, make sure that we're accounting for all of the allowable modes of the phonons. And so it turns out, and we'll derive this later, that, that there's a frequency called the Debye frequency Right, where um, uh, below which we have a, an active density of states that's shown here and above which we say there are no states. And this term here, so that Debye frequency is related to, this is the number of unit cells per unit real space volume. All right, and sometimes you'll see that eta sub a as being the number of atoms per unit volume, which is an easy calculation to make uh, if you know what material you're talking about. Uh, but we're gonna keep it a little bit more general right now because there are some caveats to using the, the atomic density uh, in, this, in this representation, and we'll cover those um, in, the, in the following week. So with that, um, that's today's lecture. I hope that you uh, sort of are starting to gain an appreciation for the way that some of the statistics that we talked about uh, relates to uh, the, the material that we covered in week one, which is about group velocities and uh, phonon dynamics. And so now we're kind of putting these things together and hopefully it's starting to make some sense. Thanks.